And so this is my lab there on the on the left. This is the the the, the current lab. Although this is actually the PhD graduation uh, after party for for Shafkat Rasul, who just graduated last year. Um, this is the the, the current uh, um, uh, cohort, um, and I will actually pop up some of these names throughout the presentation. But it's really a fantastic team, and I'm really excited to work with them. And this is where we are. We at uh, we are on the 13th floor of the McIntyre Building. Um, right next to the uh, uh, life science com part of the life science complex, and I want to highlight here that I'm also a member of the Center for Structural Biology at McGill, uh, an FRQS funded center, and I'm, I'm we're pretty active actually in that uh, center as well. And at the top, you can see our website if you want to find out more about us. And so. Um, I also have, I wear many hats. And so some of the hats that I wear are associated with uh, technological platforms. And I want to highlight that right from the start. Um, so if you're interested in, in using some of our technologies, you're, you're welcome to uh, um, and, and reach out to us. So the first one is this SPR mass spectrometry facility, which is managed and, and, and single man handed uh, uh, with, by single man, Mark Hancock, um, with directed by Gerd Multaup and, and, and myself. And so we do a lot of mass spectrometry based analysis. So intact protein analysis, low com complexity protein identification, but there's also multi imaging instrument and surface plasma and resonance. And so um, this is what we have here. And this actually, this platform is located in the McIntyre building. And we are associated with the Center for Social Biology as well, and from which we receive funding as well as from the, uh, from, from the faculty. And then on the other end, uh, just, a, just a few minutes, a uh, few 15 minutes from, from the main campus at the RIMEHC, I'm also the director of the proteomics platform over there, uh, which is managed by Lauren Taylor right here. And with staff Amy Wong here, as well as uh, Ari Gritzas, Jennifer Nedau, and Jenna Clell. And here, this is actually a full-fledged you know, um, proteomics platform. We do complex uh, mixture protein identification in gels or in solution, quantitative proteomics, as well as small molecule LCMS. Okay, so don't hesitate to reach out to, uh, to Lorne or to Mark if you're interested in using our technologies. So let's get into the actual topic. Uh, so, uh, as, as mentioned in the uh, very nice introduction uh, by Alicia, um, I work on Parkinson's disease. This has been a, a, an interest of mine for now over uh, more than a decade. Um, and so it's a, I think probably everyone on this call is familiar with this uh, disease. It's the most common movement disorder. Uh, it affects over 100,000 people in Canada. And this numbers will just keep on growing as the population ages, right? So the main risk factor for Parkinson's disease is aging, essentially. And so that's why this disease is typically late onset, above the age of 50 years old. And it's a movement disorder, and it finds its origin in the loss. Uh, so the motor symptoms find their origin in the loss of substantial nigra neurons uh, in the midbrain. So it's a neurodegenerative disorder. And so one of the idea, so, you know, that, 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 uh, that we have in the field is that these neurons are, that we find that actually control the motor movement are more vulnerable than other neurons. And so with age, these, we lose the, our cell number. We lose cell number of these substantial nigra DNA neurons more than other, other neurons. And so if you're predisposed to having Parkinson's disease, whether through environmental exposure to, um, to toxins or through uh, genetic mutations or a combination thereof, then you can actually have a more than 50% cell loss, say at the age of 70, 80. And this is where you start showing your, uh, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So there are treatments for Parkinson's. So for example, you can uh, give, uh, so I mentioned that these are uh, dopaminergic neurons. And so if you administer L-DOPA, which is a precursor of the uh, dopamine neurotransmitter, you can um, rescue to some extent, at least at the beginning of the disease, some of the motor symptoms, but the effects wanes. Uh, there's multiple problems with it, and that actually causes side effects like dystonia, for example. And so there's other treatments like deep brain surgery, surgery which is quite complex uh, to do and, and, and costly dopamine receptors, uh, agonists, anticholinergic drugs. 
But the main message I want to carry through here is that there's no cure. There's no way to stop the neurodegeneration. And I think like me and many of us, actually, that is what we're thriving to actually understand is, can we actually understand the processes going on in Parkinson's disease and, and stop or slow it? And it's a difficult, huge task. But I think the first thing that, that, that we should probably look at, and this is how I approach this problem, is to understand, so what do we know for sure? What causes the disease and what are the disease processes? So one of the hallmark of Parkinson's disease is the accumulation of these intracellular protein aggregates that are called Levy bodies. And these Levy bodies are found in the neurons that are affected in Parkinson's disease. Now I've mentioned substantial nigro dopaminergic neurons, which would be located about here. But in fact, there's other neurons are affected in Parkinson's disease and they cause a plethora of non-motor symptoms, okay? So it's not only a motor uh, uh, a movement disorder. So, but we find these aggregates in all cells that are affected and it progresses as the disease uh, advances. So in the early stage of the disease, you will find mostly these aggregates in, in, the, in the brainstem, in the midbrain, and very few actually in, in the cortex. And then at late stage of uh, the disease, then you have a lot more aggregates in these early affected areas. And then you have this widespread uh, propagation of these uh, aggregates. And so this, this, these, uh, these levy bodies are enriched in a protein called alpha synuclein, which is known to form fibrils and actually is, is causes proteotoxic stress in neurons. But that alone, the, the, the presence of levy bodies alone does not explain entirely Parkinson's disease. Because there's other diseases like dementia with Levy body, with, Le with Levy bodies that are also in, that also involve synuclein, but it's not the same neurons. So if we want to understand Parkinson's disease, we also have to be able to explain this selective vulnerability that we see in the disease. And so another set of clue that is really critical here is the involvement of mitochondrial damage in the disease. And so this is in this slide. This is we're just carrying this this idea that's in the zeitgeist right now, which is basically that you know, mitochondria um, undergo a constant amount of mitochondrial damage, which needs to be removed through various processes, okay? Including, for example, autophagy. When there's Parkinson's disease, we think that this can happen when there's an excess of damage compared to the removal, an accumulation of damaged mitochondria. This came from very early observation in the 1980s where uh, drug addicts that consume um, drugs that was contaminated with a mitochondrial poison were found to exhibit um, loss of substantial nigra neurons very early on, very rapidly after consumption of the drug. And, and now we know and we can replicate these in, in rodent models. So administration of for example, this, this drug called MPTP or pesticides like rotenol that target the same um, mitochondrial uh, respiratory chain complex can actually ac create acute uh, dopaminergic loss. Now, another set of clue is that if you impair the removal, for example, there's a number of genetic mutations that cause familial Parkinson disease in the pathways that are involved in the removal of the mitochondria, they, the, these called familial forms of Parkinson's disease that are sometimes really early onset. And at the same time, it's known that levy bodies can also affect the rate of mitochondrial turnover. And so this is why, this is what I'm really interested in, is trying to find this connection, right, between the removal of, of, of damaged mitochondria and eventually use this as a way of understanding Parkinson's disease and maybe even cure it. So for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on two particular uh, proteins that we're interested in. And um, so these two proteins are called Parkin and Pink1. And so we know that mutations in these two proteins cause familial early onset Parkinson's disease. They're recessive. You need both copies right, to, be, uh, to be impaired in order to get the disease. There are loss of function mutations. I've pointed out some of these mutations here on top of Parkin and, and Pink1. 
but it's not an exhaustive list. In fact, for Parkinson, there's over 100 mutations that are now known to cause Parkinson's disease. Some of them are missense mutation, but there's also exon deletions, uh, nonsense mutations that essentially make the protein non-functional. The other key point that I want to highlight here is that these two proteins are enzymes and the nature of the, uh, so these enzymes are essentially parking as an E3 ubiquitin ligase and pink one is a kinase. Now pink one is a really interesting kinase because it's got a mitochondrial targeting sequence at its end terminus. And in fact, when this was discovered, that was really another set of clue that linked mitochondrial damage to, uh, to Parkinson's disease. Now, if you look at Parkin, there's no mitochondrial targeting uh, sequence in, in Parkin. So from the get-go, it's not obvious that Parkin is actually involved in uh, regulating uh, mitochondria. But as you will see in the next uh, couple of slides, it's definitely the case. And so one of the things that we know is that, um, so how do we know that these, you know, what kind of processes are these proteins involved in? And I just want to highlight two, a couple of studies that I think are really interesting for, for this, this crowd right here. If we're trying to understand neurodegeneration, we should maybe try to find some animal models for the loss of these, uh, of how the, the loss of these proteins causes uh, neurodegeneration. So one, some of the earlier studies that are actually quite interesting and actually gave a lot of clues as to the involvement of Parkin and pink one in the same pathway come from Drosophila. So if you delete Parkin or pink one in Drosophila, it causes a flight muscle degeneration. So these flies just can't fly. And they also have impaired mitochondrial morphology and impaired protein turnover, specifically mitochondrial protein turnover in the electron transport chain, which are the same proteins that are targeted by these, um, these drugs that, cause, uh, that also cause Parkinson's. So... The disappointing part, but it's, it's not really disappointing as you'll see. So Parkin knockout and pink one knockout mice actually do not show neurodegeneration, but two studies here I wanna highlight. So one is when Parkin knockouts, mice are crossed with a mouse called the mutator mouse. And that's actually the, the mutator mouse is a, um, is a model of, neuro, uh, of uh, mitochondrial damage. So these mice showed neurodegeneration and that process is mediated by the CGAS ting pathway, which is actually part of a, it's, it's essentially a, an, an innate immune response. When mitochondrial DNA, for example, is released in the cytosol, this leads to sting activation, and this leads to increased cytokine production and then inflammation. Okay, so that's one clue that links essentially mitochondria not just to my, uh, uh, that link parking and to mitochondrial damage, but also how mitochondrial damage itself can create inflammatory processes, which actually lead to neurodegeneration. Now, the other one is a McGill and University of Montreal story from uh, my colleagues uh, McGill, uh, at McGill, uh, Heidi McBride, Sam Grunhein, and then University of Montreal, Michel Desjardins, and Louis-Eric Trudeau. Uh, so this, this, this one is when you take pink one knockout mice and you infect them with a pathogenic bacterium, they get intestinal infection, they recover from them, but months after, these mice will show neurodegeneration specific to the pink one knockout via a pathway that involves mitochondrial antigen presentation and the involvement in cytotoxic T cells. And I just want to highlight, this is a really cool uh, movie um, where you can see these mice, um, basically that the pink one knockout mice can compound the pole because they have these motor impairments and this can be rescued with, uh, with L-DOPA. So you'll see the mouse with the L-DOPA will actually climb down the pole quite easily. And this one is basically stuck, okay? So this is not my word. This is just to highlight that these two, this protein is definitely involving neurodegeneration, but it needs some sort of, in, of, of environmental trigger. Now let's get to what I'm actually doing. So what's, what the, what's the goal of our lab is to understand how this pathway, how pink one and parkin actually mediate mitochondrial turnover and prevent actually inflammatory, inflammatory processes like this that lead to neurodegeneration. And so the parkin pink one pathway has been studied over the past now 15, 20 years, and it goes as such, okay? So what you have is that when mitochondrial undergo damage, pink one will build up on these damaged mitochondria selectively. So pink one does not build up on, on, on damaged mitochondria, only on the damaged one. And when it's there, it will phosphorylate ubiquitin 
and recruit parkin to mitochondria. Now, parkin, I think I told you that it's an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so this now act, this phosphorylation of parkin by pink one will activate parkin. And then parkin will ubiquitinate mitochondrial proteins. And this will lead to several events. For example, mitochondrial fission or autophagy or even production of mitochondrial derived vesicles that carry damaged protein cargo. And this is the pathway that we want to understand at the molecular level using structural biology and proteomics. And why we want to do this? Because eventually we'd like to be able to rescue malfunction in this uh, pathway. And so what do we know about these proteins? Well, pink one now is becoming pretty clear that it's a mitochondrial damage sensor. Okay. And so under steady state, so when mitochondria are not uh, damaged, pink one is being synthesized in the cytosol. So just for uh, your information, pink one is actually nuclear encoded. So it's mRNAs, goes to the cytosol, it's being translated there. Is the, the protein is then imported through this translocase of the outer membrane. So that's called the TUM complex. So it's a translocase. Translocates pink one, then through processes that are maybe not so well understood. There's a lot of studies, but I don't think we've come up with a really consistent um, uh, understanding of it. But what's clear is that it's cleaved in the inner membrane by a protein called PARL, which is a rhomboid protease. And then it's cleaved in the matrix by this protein called MPP, which Andrew works on and will tell you uh, after uh, my talk. Um, so this cleavage, especially by PARL, makes the protein susceptible to degradation by proteasome. So pink one is constantly made and degraded, and it's degraded faster than it's made. So that means that under steady state, under normal conditions, so here these are cells just treated with controlled DMSO, there's very little pink one. Now, if you damage mitochondria, for example, if you use um, a compound called CCCP, which is actually a depolarization agent, you depolarize mitochondria, pink one will build up on those mitochondria. And when it builds up, it forms this very large complex with the tongue uh, translocase. And so if you, for example, do run a blue native page, so this is data from Mohamed Eldiv in Ted Fon's lab, you can see that as you treat with CCCP, pink one will accumulate but, uh, and form a very large molecular weight at 720 kilodalton. If you block for one of those subunits in the TOM complex called TOM40, you see that normally before we add CCP, it actually builds up. It, it's normally found at 480 kilodalton. And then as we add CCP, it builds up as a 720 kilodalton band. Okay. Now we know that this phenomenon also happens with other forms of damage. So, so for example, when there's the mitochondrial unfolded protein response. So when unfolded protein accumulates, on mitochondria or inside mitochondria, then pink one will also accumulate and form that, 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 that complex. Same with reactive oxygen species, okay? Or actually compound that will create the uh, formation of reactive oxygen species. And so it, it looks like pink one is actually an integrator of, 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 of mitochondrial damage. And what it does after that, because I told you it's a kinase, well, pink one will phosphorylate ubiquitin and the parkin ubiquitin like domain. And this in turn will trigger parkin E3 ligase activity. So let's go through this. So back in 2014, I collaborated with a group in Japan where what we did is essentially is we treated cells with CCCP. And in one case, I used siRNA against pink one. In the other one, I, I did not. I used a non-targeting siRNA. So you can see the knockdown of pink one. We did phosphopeptide enrichment and LCMS, and we identify a single difference between these two sets in terms of how much phosphoprotein there was. And essentially it was ubiquitin serine 65. And so ubiquitin is the main target for the ubiquitin, for the kinase activity of pink one. So we confirmed that with recombinant pink one, which we take from an insect, uh, because we cannot express the human pink one yet in, in E. coli. And so what we do is that we, um, we, we incubate pink one with wild type ubiquitin or S65A ubiquitin. So serine 65 is the serine which is mutate, which is phosphorylated by pink one. 
And then we run the products of the phosphorylation reaction on the phosphatic gel. And so a phosphatic gel is essentially just a gel that causes a gel shift when the protein is phosphorylated. So here you can see, for example, with wild type, but no pink one, you have no shift. And then if you add wild type pink one, then you create a shift because the protein is phosphorylated at serine 65. Now, if you mutate serine 65 to an alanine, it can no longer be phosphorylated, and then you don't have a shift. Okay. And now, what is phosphorubiquitin doing? And well, what it does is that it activates parkin, and it enables parkin phosphorylation, uh, parkin activation. Okay. So here, this is an assay that we published uh, in 2015 with a group of Cali Gehring. And here, what you can see is that you have parkin, which auto-ubiquitinates. So when parkin auto-ubiquitinates, you can see the formation of this ladder across, above the uh, essentially single band here, uh, monomeric uh, parkin and uh, unmodified parkin. And so if you had um, phospho-UB, you can see some stimulation of the E3 ligase activity. You can see that without the E3, just with the E1 enzyme and, and ubiquitin conjugating enzymes, there's essentially no activity. Phospho-UB stimulates it. But now if you phosphorylate parkin on top of it, so if you, for example, if you phosphorylate the ubiquitin-like domain of parkin, then it will actually be fully active. And now with, we not understand very well, and I'll come back to that later in the talk, we understand very well actually how activation works. Okay. Now it seems that it would be important to understand how pink one phosphorylate ubiquitin in order to understand how you can trigger the whole pathway. Because the moment that you create phosphorubiquitin, it's, it's essentially you, you, you trigger mitophagy and you trigger parking activation. So this is tightly controlled in cells. And so one of the things that we did, and I, I, I wanted to show you some of that data just to highlight what we can do in our platform. We, I told you that we're investigating this insect variant of pink one, which we call TC pink one from the name of the organism called Tribolium castaneum. And one of the things that we have observed is that this protein needs to be autophosphorylated in order to phosphorylate ubiquitin. And so we wanted to better characterize how this autophosphorylation worked. And so one of the experiments that we did is that we mixed just diffused TC pink one which is active, so it's the wild type, and we incubate it with a, vari a variant of pink one, which is kinase dead, so it cannot autophosphorylate. But this one can phosphorylate it in trans. And so when we take these products and we run them on our mass pack, we can see this, this, um, this beautiful AT Dalton chip that corresponds to a single phosphorylation. And if we digest that band, we, we can identify that it's phosphorylated on serine 205. Now, that CR205 in the insect pink one corresponds to CR228 in human, and it's absolutely invariant and, and, and conserved, and it's located in a region which is really critical for kinase activation. Now, if we carry this through in humans, well, what we can see is that this autophosphorylation at CR228 in human is actually required for ubiquitin phosphorylation as well. So let's go through this experiment. So here we have um, U2OS pink one knockout cells. They don't have pink one. We can transfect them with wild type pink one and then treat these cells with CCCP, which you will recall leads to pink one accumulation and then activation of mitophagy. So if we add CCCP, you can see that pink one accumulates and then we have an antibody against phosphoubiquitin and phosphoubiquitin will actually form chains on outer membrane proteins. And so this is why it appears like a, a ladder like this, this smear. But this, you have this very clear smear formation in the presence of CCCP and wild type enzyme. But if you transfect a variant of pink one, which has this autophosphorylation site mutated to an alanine, then you cannot get this phosphoubiquitin chain formation, even though pink one does accumulate. So the ability of pink one to accumulate of mitochondria is independent of its autophosphorylation and ability to phosphorylate ubiquitin. But you need autophosphorylation in order to carry through um, um, ubiquitin phosphorylation. Okay. Now we wanted to understand how this process worked. And so we've recently published this, this paper. This is done by my uh, PhD student, Shafkat Rasul. And and essentially, what we wanted to do is crystallize pink one in its non-phosphorylated state 
or monophosphorylated state and understand how that autophosphorylation takes place. We were also lacking a structure of the entire fragment of this uh, cytosolic fragment of pink one. And so through a lot of protein engineering that I won't bore you with, we were able to basically get this really nice single peak by mass spec form of pink one and it crystallized in both the APO form and the monophosphorylated form bound to a nucleotide analog. And you can see the structure right here. You can see we have the different element of pink one. We have the C lobe, the N lobe. And if you look at the back side, you see that this N terminal helix binds to the C terminal extension in blue. Okay. So just to show you again. And then here in sandwich between the N lobe and C lobe, you have the nucleotide right here. So now that's interesting, but really it just looks like a regular kinase, except for that NTCTA domain at the back. Okay. So what was more interesting, and this is the beauty of, 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 of structural biology, is that when you, you look at the entire crystal lattice, you can form that, that, you can see that there's actually a dimer here. So you see that you have two copies binding to each other. And at the interface of these two copies, what you can see is that the serine 205 of, for example, this pink copy goes into the active site where the nucleotide is of the blue subunit and vice versa, right? This is reciprocal. So the serine 205 of the blue goes into the active site of the red, okay? And this is why it's specifically phosphorylate just that residue, okay? Now we've done a lot of work in mutagenesis to confirm that this interface does exist, that actually is critical for autophosphorylation. But the other thing that we also wanted to uh, look at is the role of this NTCT module at the back. So these are these, these, these helices that are located on the other side. So this is actually a side view of this dimer that you're looking at here. So this is the dimer where we find the acceptor serine to 28. This is a human pink one. And then you have the ATP, which is there. So this is how it mediates phosphorylation. Now, what is really interesting is that this NTCTE is located kind of on the side, okay? And in fact, we have structures of the Tom complex, and it's also a dimer. And so we think that this, this dimer of pink one sits on the Tom dimer. And this is why essentially the Tom complex enables pink one to autophosphorylate. So we wanted to see what was the role of this NTCT module in actually docking pink one onto Tom. And so that's easy. We have a structure. So we were able to use the structure to design two mutants that impair um, the NTCT interface. So first, just a sanity check, right? Just see, the, uh, is our autophosphorylation site, for example, uh, uh, interface important? So we can mutate, for example, one tyrosine here to an alanine, which we thought was critical for uh, autophosphorylation. And in fact, if you uh, look at uh, this red bar here, you can see that this tyrosine 454A abrogates phosphoubiquitin formation. So autophosphorylation is required for ubiquitin phosphorylation, but it does not impair the formation of this 720 kilodalton band by blue native page. Now, if you look at these NTCTU mutations, so we have this I128E and L531E mutations, they're also dead for ubiquitin phosphorylation, but they cannot, they can no longer form that pink one tum uh, complex by blue native page. So what this tells us is that you first need to have pink Tom stabilization in order to, to phosphorylate ubiquitin. Okay. Now, using that crystal structure, we do many other things. Um, so actually, just to wrap up here, we're very interested in determining actually the, the structure of that complex, right? The pink one bound to Tom. And this is actually ongoing work that I'm not quite ready to present. But what we I'm ready to present is this work that is actually coming up from my lab. So we have discovered uh, a series of kinase inhibitors uh, that typically that actually are are known to inhibit the um, the spleen tyrosine kinase it's called SYK, and so we discovered this through a thermal shift assay, and these molecules inhibit the kinase activity of pink one as well. Um, so here you have this these experiment done by uh, my PhD student uh, Tara Shomali where she showed, for example, that as you have increasing drug uh, amounts, you can get these very nice um, uh, inhibition of ATP uh, hydrolysis using the uh, kinase glow assay. And we have this series of compounds that look alike, 
and they all inhibit with various uh, IC50s that are in the sort of low micromolar range. We have a project which aims to actually improve uh, the, uh, the, F the affinity of these inhibitors for pink one with the goal of eventually developing drugs and, and tool compounds for, for pink. Now, these compounds not only work against, this is against insect pink one, but they also work against human pink one. So this is what we call an inorganello assay, where we basically take human pink one from, that are on human mitochondria, and we incubate them with ubiquitin, tetraubiquitin. And we can just use our phosphoubiquitin antibody, and you can see that these molecules, for example, PRT062607, strongly inhibits phos uh, phosphorylation of ubiquitin. And we even have a crystal structure now. So we use our structural work to actually, actually uh, find out how these compounds bind. And we'll use the structure to design more potent uh, inhibitors in the future. OK. Now, just a uh, last uh, little story before I, I see the microphone to uh, Andrew. Um, so this has actually come from a collaboration with, with uh, Kelly Gehring's lab, as well as Ted Font lab. Um, so here, this particular bit of work was done by, uh, in large part by Veronique Sauvé, who's our research associate and my partner. Uh, and she's in Kelly Gehring's lab, picture here. And essentially this, I'm summarizing a whole lot of work here, but this started off with determining the crystal structure of Parkin in the inactive state. So that goes back way back to 2013. So we knew it was inactive. This was an inactive confirmation because the ring one domain is the one that binds the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. And you see that this yellow blob right here basically blocks that. So when ubiquit phosphoubiquitin binds to Parkin and it binds with very high affinity. So earlier on, you may remember I told you that Pink one has a mitochondrial targeting sequence, but Parkin doesn't. But Parkin goes to mitochondria through phosphoubiquitin. So if you label mitochondria with phosphoubiquitin, Parkin will go there like a magnet, right? And so, and not only does it bind, but it also releases the ubiquitin like domain, which is bound here. And now the UBL domain can be phosphorylated by pink one. Why? Because both have the same serine, serine 65. So you see three Parkin orthologs here. They have the same serine 65 as ubiquitin. Now this phosphoubiquitin binds to this place. So you have this huge conformational change where the phosphoubl binds here and basically dislodge the active site, which is located on this ring two domain, as well as dislodging this rep domain. And this allows formation of the active complex of Parkin, where you have the E2 enzyme conjugated to ubiquitin, which can then be transferred to that ring two enzyme, which will then transfer it to substrate. So we now have a very good understanding of, 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 of this uh, process, thanks to a lot of structural work from, from this group and, and, and others. So now, what can we use this to inform perhaps uh, drug design and inform our understanding of Parkin Pink One uh, pathway? So one of the things that we published back in 2017 is that we knew that we could use even the inactive structure to design activating mutations. So you can introduce these mutations located at these interdomain inter, uh, interfaces. And when you introduce these mutations, you can increase Parkin activity, both in vitro and in cells. So for instance, here we're using something called mitochyma, which is actually a fluorescent reporter for mitophagy, and, which, and then we use facts to basically quantify how much of the cells undergo mitophagy. And this is all graphed on the left-hand side right here. And so what you can see is that after treatment with CCCP, we, and while type Parkin is transfected, we can get mitophagy induction. If you mutate the catalytic site to a serine, it's no longer active. But now let's focus on this tryptophan mutation, which is located in the rep. If you mutate it to an alanine, we know we, we can actually stimulate mitophagy to an even greater extent than the wild type. Um, and so I just want to point out here that, um, we have, um, if you take these uh, activating mutations and you combine them with pathogenic mutations, you can rescue some of them. So for example, we have this mutation here, uh, K211N, which is part of the phospho-UBL binding site. So if you mutate this, this lysine to an asparagine, it's dead. So if you look at the single mutation, this is actually the, um, the pink part. See, this is all normalized to wild type, which is this dashed line. 
So this K to 11 N mutant is impaired. The bar is very low. But now if you make a double mutant, if you make K to 11 N combined with tryptophan 403A, so that's the blue bar right here, you can see that we rescue its activity. Okay, I'll skip that part. I just want to go right here. And so that, you know, we can, th that's, that's great. And can we use this to inform drug design? So we've explored at length how we can actually activate Parkin. And this is actually a study which is currently at, uh, under uh, review, will be published very soon, um, where essentially we've done, introduced a number of mutations in both human and rat Parkin and actually found that all of the activating mutations are located either at the ring zero, ring two interface or at the rep ring one interface. And all these other sites that we uh, were perhaps thought to be activating, in fact, don't really activate much, Parkin or, or not at all. And, we dis and, and this comes about from destabilizing the enzyme. So the inactive enzyme is very stable. And if we destabilize it, for example, we can see that all these activating mutations inversely correlate with the melting temperature of the protein. And if you introduce these mutations and you combine them with these inactive mutations, with uh, this S65A mutation, which cannot be phosphorylated, and so it's inactive, it's like a Parkinson disease causing mutation. Essentially, we can rescue some of them. For example, tryptophan 3 can rescue, or this V393D mutation can rescue. And this V933D mutation is also located in REP. So what we think based on this is that this rep ring one interface is really a hotspot for pharmacological activation of Parkin. And this is guiding our current uh, work, uh, guiding our current work on trying to actually push uh, drug design for, for, for Parkin. So the last thing I wanna mention, um, as because I think this is the perfect crowd to mention this, is that I do all of this structural work, but on the, because I'm also the director of Protein Mac, proteomics platform, and I'm also interested in eventually solving this issue of single cell, uh, sorry, this issue of, of uh, neuronal vulnerability in Parkinson's disease. I really got interested into single cell technologies. We don't have yet data to come with this, but this led to a really great collaboration uh, with multiple uh, investigators at McGill that are listed on the, uh, on, the, on the left here. And this is a project that we, we will build up and coordinated with Marine right here. And this is actually try to basically form a McGill integrated single cell omics uh, group, uh, which will include single cell proteomics, which we don't have yet the instruments for at McGill, but as well equipment for transcriptomics, imaging, and, and bioinformatics. And you know, this is basically the, the whole figure, the whole gist of this CFI 2023 application that we're waiting the results. Um, but I just want to highlight that you know, this is just around the corner. Uh, if that CFI is not successful, we'll fund this in some other ways. Um, but this is actually a very exciting time, actually, to, to actually move into this, this area. And I know you're welcome to reach out to me if you're interested to know more about this. And so that's it. So thank you, everyone involved. Thanks to all the funding organization. And now it's time for Andrew to take it on. Mm -hmm.